So good afternoon, welcome uh, to this uh, presentation given during the week of Academy of Sciences at the Institute of Physics. Uh, we have, uh, I think this is probably the first English language presentation that we had at least this year. And I am very happy to welcome Max Stadelmeier, uh, who is uh, here at our institute uh, as a part of a European mobility project. He comes from Germany and uh, he works here uh, within the group uh, that uh, studies the data from the Pierre Roger Observatory. Max specifically uses artificial intelligence and machine learning to find the deepest secrets about our universe. And he came here today to talk about the universe in general, which I think I, I have absolutely no idea what he's going to speak about. Uh, I, I would like to use this opportunity to remind you that after the talk ends, we still have some excursions and we have this uh, large chill out zone where we have some interactive experiments that you can come have a look at it's all in the solid building uh, on the other side so now please max start with your talk and have fun yeah thanks a lot honza so pleasure to be here today in the uh, czech academy of sciences at the institute of physics so as he just mentioned uh, briefly my uh, rather hard task today is to tell you something about the universe in general and what is interesting about the universe and what we are doing here uh, at the Institute of Physics to try and research the universe. And just uh, to start us off, what I'm showing you here is a nice picture from the James Webb Telescope. I think you all have heard about it. It just was, was just launched by NASA a few weeks ago. And this is something uh, which I found particularly beautiful, which is the Carina Nebula in our galactic neighborhood. So this is a picture which was taken from something within our galaxy and uh, this is pictures like this are usually what uh, motivate people to do space research and to do physics and everything I hope I can give you some of this motivation today so some couple of hundred years ago so in the 16th century our picture of the world looked like this and this was during the time also when Copernicus was working here in Prague people imagined the uh, the universe or the world to look like this where you have the Sun in the middle and you have the uh, earth a little bit far out with the moon and everything you have the planets in the middle and the outermost shell here uh, is what they call the stellarum immobilis so the stars which would not move they were just painted on uh, on, a, on a surface at the very outermost rim of what we can see and this is how we imagine or how we picture the universe today and at, uh, at first glance it doesn't look so much different yeah? so we are still here in the middle and, but this picture is, of course, much more complicated and it requires an awful lot of explanation. So let's go through this a bit step by step. So the first thing that we see here uh, in the middle, our direct neighborhood is the solar system. So this is where we live, this is where we have the sun, the earth, the moon, you see different planets, you see here Mercury, Jupiter, Saturn, and so on and so on. Uh, and this is what we can directly see and reach from our home planet. And the next outermost ring here where it gets a little busy, you see a lot of small dots, you see uh, other solar systems. Yeah? You see stars, you see clouds, you see nebulas, things like what I just showed you on the title page, uh, something like the Carina Nebula. This is all here located in our galaxy, in our home, let's say really a galactic home. And uh, there are millions and millions of stars here, too, too much to explore and too much to talk about. Uh, but it still even continues. Yeah, this is just our home galaxy that we see here, the Milky Way. When we look further, we actually even see different galaxies. You might have heard their names like the Andromeda Galaxy, or at some point they start just being numbered like M87 and so on and so on. And these are places that we can see, but we already know we cannot reach them anymore. Yes? And in our galactic neighborhood, um, or in our extra galactic neighborhood, we see a few of these galaxies quite close by. And then at some point, um, yeah, it becomes even more messy and, and, uh, and big. So th the next big thing, if we look even further into the universe, we see clusters of galaxies. So similarly, like stars or solar systems yeah, form galaxies, you have uh, huge, gigantic objects, which we call galaxy clusters, which are made of millions and millions of galaxies, which form big, large-scale things in the universe, which you can just faintly see here at, uh, at the edge of what I'm showing. And if we go f even further, we see something that we call filaments. So at some point, uh, we end up seeing billions of billions of galaxies forming 
small strings in the emptiness of space, and in between we have voids where there's essentially nothing, and everything looks uh, a little bit like, yeah, I actually just pictured this to in the morning uh, when I had breakfast. It looks a little bit like a croissant, the universe at a large scale. So we have small layers of galaxy clusters and galaxy uh, galaxies, well, sticking to each other, and then you have a lot of nothingness in between. If we look even further into this, and we can look even further, we see, well, what you see here is that you see nothing. It gets relatively dark. So there we see the early universe, things we do not really yet understand, things that we do not know what happened there or what is going on there. And these are the things which are very, very far away from us. And I'm going to come back to you uh, in a second why this is called the early universe. But there is even one step we can uh, we can go further and look deeper into into the universe. And there we see something that we uh, call the CMB, which is the afterglow of the Big Bang, well, the afterglow of the, of the moment of creation, of the cosmic microwave background. Uh, and I will talk about this in a second as well. So when we look at the whole picture as a whole, yeah, even after this quick explanation with a lot of insights we gained in the last couple of hundred years, you see we didn't go so far, right, in the last 400 years. So it still looks a little bit the same, but it became more complicated. So um, when I say we look into uh, the deepness of space, uh, we have to remind us one thing. Yeah? Whenever we see something, we only see light. But since Einstein, we know light travels, and light takes some time to travel. So the further something is away from us, um, unfortunately, the light is older and older. So we, when we measure distance, we actually measure it in the, um, in the unit of light years that you might have heard of which is the time that the light takes from some object to reach us. So when we see something very very distant, very faint, we actually see it the way it was some maybe some million years ago before the light was created and emitted to reach us. And to give you some, some scale, yeah, how this is arranged, because the map is obviously not really a lot up to scale, yeah, I'm just showing you how to sort all the things, starting from, again, our solar system, which is the here and now, where we are. So. When we reach the edge of our solar system with the planets that we know, uh, for example, uh, when we try to, to reach Pluto, this is about five light hours away. So the light from the sun takes about five hours away yeah, to go to Pluto. In the other way around, the yeah, light that comes from Pluto that is reflected there takes five hours roughly to reach us. And if we see the, the center of our galaxy, so light that comes from there, um, it is already an, a number which is unimaginably large. It's 20, uh, 27,000 light years. So uh, even the center of our galaxy we cannot see in, in real time, so to say, but it's already um, something that is very, very distant. And we could never reach it. Yeah, Even the, um, the closest star to us, I, I didn't put it uh, here uh, actually, but the, the next star that we see, our really direct neighbor, is already three to four light years away. So our spaceship would take four years at the speed of light to go there, and the galactic center is even further away. So the next galaxy, or the next couple of galaxies uh, that are around, they're around 500,000 light years away. And from there on, it becomes just uh, more and more crazy and, and hard to imagine. So here we are at the scale of, uh, uh, let me see, of clusters. And um, there we are at 20, uh, 250 million light years. And this is not only the scale yeah, where we start to think in this dimension, but it's also the scale how large these uh, clusters are. We ourselves, yeah, as a part of the, as, as inhabitants of the Milky Way, we are part of a galaxy cluster, uh, we're probably part of a galaxy cluster, and this is about the size of these clusters, yeah, where we see that. Filaments and voids are then um, in the order of 10 billion light years. This is uh, where we start to look in the early universe. And this is also then the time that the, the light takes to reach us. And I'm saying early universe because now we are approaching more and more the moment of creation, yeah, which is the Big Bang. And we see the Big Bang afterglow, which is light, which was emitted roughly 13.7 billion years ago. And this is where we think that all started. And to uh, to show you what we are doing here, yeah, I'm trying to, to split this today after this quick introduction into three parts. What we are doing at the FZU are mainly three disciplines that I want to highlight. The first is cosmology, and we have some uh, some world-leading experts in cosmology uh, here, which are 
trying to answer the, the question, how does the universe work as a whole? They, tr they try to look at everything in, in one big picture and try to understand the universe from beginning to finish until today. We have part particle physicists here, and particle physics usually means collider physics, and they try to observe what happened directly after the Big Bang. They focus on the early universe. And there are some cool exhibitions, that's, as Honza just mentioned, in the, uh, the chill-out room in the other building, uh, which particularly focus on, uh, on the ATLAS experiment at the Large Hadron Collider, on this one. And the last discipline I find particularly interesting, because this is where I'm working at, is astroparticle physics. This is where we try to understand how all the big things in the universe, which are there today, like galaxies, stars, black holes, and so on, and clouds, how do they work, what happens there, and, um, and how does this affect us and maybe our everyday life. So starting uh, with cosmology, where we try to look at the universe yeah, that I just showed you in this, uh, in this layer picture as a whole, um, in terms of cosmology, we picture the universe a bit like this. Yeah? And this picture has one peculiarity. You have a timeline going from left to the right. And um, the, uh, on the left-hand side here, you see the Big Bang, where we assume everything started. And from there on, the universe expanded, changed. At some point, galaxies and planets formed. And at some point, our planet formed, something like three, four billion years ago. And then... Um, until today, everything just uh, expands and expands. And this is one, I think, uh, very interesting thing. We know today the universe is getting bigger and bigger and bigger every second. And we know this from one particular observation. And this is what I'm showing you here. So this is a, an artist's um, picture of how we see the universe. But this already tells us um, the universe is getting bigger Bec for, for, a, for a simple reason, as you will see in a second. We see galaxies and stars here in blue and, uh, and white light, uh, and some in red light. And from the red light, we know that they are moving away from us. And the effect is quite simple. You know, for example, when you see a, uh, a police car on the road, yeah, which is driving towards you, and you can hear the sound. When it's driving towards you, it sounds a little bit different like when it's driving away from you. When it's driving away from you, the sound is a bit more dull, a bit more deep, yeah, a bit, bit sharp, not sharp, but flat. Um, and more or less the same thing happens with galaxies in terms of their light, because light, in some sense, behaves the same way as sound from, from a police car. So when a galaxy is moving, moving towards us, we see it blue, or we see it uh, a little bit bright. And when a galaxy is moving away from us, we see it in red. So when we go back here, and you see the smaller and more faint galaxies, when they are all red, then you know they are moving away from us. And somebody... Uh, actually, a lot of people, but uh, one that you probably all know, uh, took a deeper look at this, and this was Edwin Hubble. And he studied the velocity, so the speed at which the galaxies are moving away from us, as a function of the distance where he sees them. And then for every galaxy uh, he saw, well, he just made a dot on this graph. Yeah? So you put the velocity as a function of the distance here. And here, for example, you see very distant galaxies, and they're moving away very quickly and very closed galaxies, they're almost not moving away from, each, from us. And uh, at this point, well, it's very tempting to just try to see a law here and put a line into this. And this is what Hubble did, and this is what we know as Hubble's law. And the slope of this line is the Hubble constant, H0. And from this, when, um, when you see everything is moving away from us, and everything is moving away from us faster and faster, the, the, the far it is away from us, we have to ask the question, where did it all come from? Was it all together at some point? Yeah? And also this people ask themselves. And today, we actually know that there is an answer to this question. So we are luckily the first generation which has a creation myth that we assume is right, which is the Big Bang. So there was a moment when everything started. There was a moment when time began to be uh, countable, where matter was created maybe out of nothing. And uh, the reason we are very certain about this uh, happening, or that this has happened, is we can see it. We can see the afterglow, not directly the Big Bang, but we can see the afterglow of it. So I don't know, has anybody yet seen this picture here? Maybe a couple of hands raised, very nice. Yeah. So do you also know that do you see Stephen Hawking's initials here? <laughs> yeah, some, th there is a better picture from an earlier experiment, but uh, you can still see it a bit. So. 
uh, some people joke that he imprinted himself on the cosmic microwave background forever. So what you can see here is a little bit like a, like a land map. Yeah? So you would see an equator here. This is the North Pole. This is the South Pole. But instead of looking on the Earth, we look in the sky. So this is a sky map. So this is light that is coming from all directions in the universe. It's not visible light. We need special, uh, special uh, things to see it. For example, this is the Planck satellite, which did this picture here. And um, the small wrinkles you see here yeah, in, in, in uh, red and in blue are small temperature fluctuations. And um, I know it's, it's not intuitive to say temperature with respect to, to light, but you could say some of the light is a bit more blue, some of the light is a bit more red but it's all not in the, in the optical region, so you need special telescopes to see it. Uh, but it's there. And the first people who actually saw this, uh, this light if from an early universe were these two guys, Penzias and Wilson on, uh, on Riley's lab in the 1960s. And as many scientific discoveries happened, they actually wanted to do something very different. They actually wanted to do radio astronomy, so what they had in the background was a big antenna. And in their antenna, they always heard some kind of noise, like you would expect from a broken radio. Like <laughs> and they, they just couldn't get rid of it. it um, it's a little bit like old TVs when you turn them on and you have no signal and you see the white and, uh, and black noise running over everything. Actually, some of the signal is coming from the same origin. It's the same noise. Not all of it, but part of it. So they set up their big antenna and they thought it's not working well. And one thing they saw in, in their antenna was some, uh, some pigeons were living inside there. And unfortunately, yeah, there were also some bird droppings coming from the pigeons on their antenna. So they immediately thought, OK, we have to clean the, the antenna, remove the pigeons, and then everything will work out. They did it, removed the birds, the birds came back, the birds again shit on the antenna, unfortunately. The noise was still there. So what they did, and we remember this until today because this was an Im important discovery. They killed the birds yeah, for, for the sake of science. Uh, and only afterwards they realized they didn't need to because this, the noise was still there. And um, in the publication they did, actually, they did not mention this as a big discovery. They wrote a footnote. And in their footnote they said this could have been uh, this noise. This could have been some signal some light emitted from an early universe, maybe the afterglow of the Big Bang. And this footno footnote gave them the Nobel Prize because they were right. So how would you imagine this, uh, this light uh, being emitted? So I, I, I tried to think about an equivalent to show you in, a, uh, in an intuitive way how this uh, works. And uh, you can imagine in the simplest way the Big Bang like an explosion. And I found a, a nice video from an underwater explosion. And maybe you know the small guys. I didn't know them before. And uh, if we just go through some pictures of an explosion underwater, you see at first everything is very hot, and very dense in the middle, and you see it's very bright, but you cannot see through. And as it expands, yeah, what actually happens, it, it becomes colder and colder. The energy is distributed over more space. And at some point, yeah, it gets bigger and bigger, and even though it's very bright, it's not as hot and as bright as in the beginning. And at some point, you can see through this bubble. And this point, when in the universe, when you could first see through the bubble, which was at first the explosion of the Big Bang, this is when, when this light was emitted. We call it decoupling, because this light was actually interacting with the hot, dense state, soup of the early Big Bang. And at some point, the universe cooled down, and this light could just propagate freely in the universe until today when sometimes our detectors see it or sometimes it hits your television and creates a small noise. Yeah, and this is more or less the state we are in today. So um, the cosmic microwave background does not just tell us that there was uh, a Big Bang, but it also tells us a, a, s a whole lot of things. I cannot go into detail of all of them, but one thing which is very important is that the cosmic microwave background lets us calculate the age of the universe. Because with this observation, something that is very important is we know that the universe is flat on average. Since Einstein, we know that, uh, that space and time in general can be curved and bent. And this is some mathematically very complex problem. Um, and you're free to, uh, to study these equations. They're very nice, easy to derive, I was told. So if you're, uh, if you're fit in differential geometry, this takes you five minutes, but I'm not. Um, but um, the most important thing to take home is 
we know from predictions from people who understand these equations that if these wrinkles here, if these small fluctuations, if they are of the order of one degree, like one degree on the sphere that we see, then the universe should be flat on average. Yeah, so what people did is they were just studying these wrinkles and these fluctuations here. Oh, I forgot I have a slide for this. So <laughs> and what you see here on the right hand side is just uh, a graph which shows you the amplitude of fluctuations at larger or smaller scales. And here you see a big excess which is roughly at one degree or more or less precisely at one degree. And this tells us the universe is flat and from here on we can do some calculations and actually take a look at the edge of the universe. The other wrinkles and humps here are also very interesting, but I have to leave these for a different day. So we know how fast the universe is expanding today. Yeah? So we are here on this graph when we take a look at the distance between galaxies and uh, well, the billions of years in the future and the past. And now we know that the universe is flat, yeah? so that this distance had to be growing more or less in a, uh, in a linear shape, not in an exponential or, uh, or somehow a different, differently curved state. So after some calculation, we can just take a look at the Hubble constant. We can take a look at some function f, which depends on dark matter and a lot of complicated stuff. And uh, luckily, this f is more or less 1. Yeah? So if we just invert the Hubble constant, what turns out is the age of the universe is 13.7 billion years, where today we are relatively certain that this is the case. So I just mentioned it. Yeah, there is one problem with the universe. Yeah, and most of the things in the universe we cannot see. We call it dark matter. And when I say most of the things, I mean it's really most of the things that, that are there, that are massive. Only 20% of the uh, things that weigh anything in the universe are stars, galaxies, black holes, everything that we can picture. Yeah? And all the other things are dark. And it's called dark matter not because it's some kind of black chunk that is floating around somewhere, but we just call it dark matter because it doesn't shine. Usually all the other matter is either shining itself, like suns or galaxies, or it's being, um, yeah, it's being radiated upon and then it shines back. But dark matter does not. And the big problem with dark matter is we do not know what it is. We have no clue. Yeah? We have some theories, but so far none of them tested correctly in any way. And um, there are some very good hints that these are particles and not just some, uh, some misunderstanding of our wave or how gravity works. For example, what I show you here is the bullet cluster galaxy. What you see here in red, uh, these are clouds and, and solar systems from two galaxies which were moving towards each other relatively fast and they collided and they you see here this looks like a, a bullet going through through some metal plate this is why they gave it the name bullet cluster you know? and this uh, this red part of the image this is something that we can actually see this is what something that radiates something that glows but this purple bluish part this is the interesting one because this we cannot see but we know from observing the background and from observing this whole picture that here and here, this is where the matter is concentrated. So it looks like when the two galaxies collided, most of the matter just went through each other yeah, and went past each other and is still there without any interaction. And this is what we call the dark matter. So it's a little bit like you would run into another person and your shadow just keeps running for some reason. This is what we see with the galaxies, but we do not know what actually is dark matter. So. And how do we find out what dark matter is? And there's one very straightforward way to do this, and this is particle physics. So something which we also do at the um, FZU is particle physics. And in particle physics, we try to study the early universe. Yeah? We try to, to find out how was it like shortly after the Big Bang. So how were particles created? Which kind of particles were created? And what properties do these particles have? And there's, um, well, one part of the exhibition in the other room is uh, a virtual tour, dark glass detector, which you can see here in the background. And just for scale, I, I don't know if you noticed him, but there's a man standing there. So this detector is really huge. It's one of the largest man-made machines ever built. It's, it's in Switzerland in, uh, at the Large Hadron Collider. It's roughly 200 meters underground, and it's 30 stories high. So it's really unbelievable. If you ever have the chance to go there, 
I recommend you to do it. It's, it's fascinating to stand there and, and see this detector. And you can start with the virtual tour today. So what we are doing yeah, when we are trying to, uh, to simulate the uh, yeah, conditions after the Big Bang is usually collider physics. So you have a particle collider, yeah, like this one here at CERN, you have all heard about it, and this is where the ATLAS detector that I just showed you uh, is located. And you uh, accelerate particles, and you bring them to high energies like they were shortly after the Big Bang. And you bring them actually to insanely high energies. Yeah? They are so fast that they would go around the Earth five times per second, yeah, which is almost the uh, speed of light. So every second, uh, you would have to go around like this. So in this ring, each particle goes around 11,000 times per second. And then at this point, usually people ask, well, this is a hadron collider or a particle collider. Do they always meet each other? And the answer is no. <laughs> so most of the times, they just pass uh, without doing anything. But sometimes, and this, well, this sometimes still happens a couple of thousand times per second, but not so often as, uh, as it could. Sometimes, two particles, they collide head on. At th this point where they meet, they form a tiny explosion. And this tiny explosion is a little bit like a micro Big Bang, like a moment where we can create new <coughs> particles, where we can create new things. And in this moment, yeah, you see a lot of new things going in each direction, because once you collide two particles at these energies, what they do is they form a small <coughs> ball just of energy. And out of this energy, everything can can be created, yeah, which which is everything that is there can be created just uh, in a stochastic way, yeah, with some certain probabilities. And this is at, lea at least how we imagine it. And these particles fly away in all directions. And when they fly away, you try to, to catch them and to, to find their signal. And from this, what is created in the small explosion, we try to understand what was happening in the small explosion. And this is how such a signal looks like. This is a signal from the Atlas detector. So this is a computer picture of all the different components of the detector reacting to this particles created in the small explosion in the middle. Uh, and you see it just looks fascinating. Yeah? You have some particle flying out in this direction, some in this direction. Most of them go into the direction of the beam. Um, and here we then search for, uh, for new particles. And this is how this looks like. Has anybody seen such a picture before? Yeah. Of so we have physicists here, I see. No? Okay, Th even better then, yeah. So this is what uh, is called a Feynman diagram. And this is the, let's say, the, the mathematical picture how we want to uh, describe what's happening here. So in a, in a simple form, yeah, you, you collide two particles, just as I showed you here. Then they form a, a virtual intermediate particle, and then new stuff flies out on the right-hand side. This is the whole thing, yeah. But when we draw these simple pictures, actually there's some, some thought that goes into it before. So this is represented by some, uh, by some uh, S matrix integral. And maybe now the question again, have you seen the calculations for it before? <laughs> yeah, I, will, I will not do anything today. <laughs> okay, perfect. So yeah, this is rather complicated. So let's stay with the picture. Um, and with these small pictures, yeah, these help us to, to understand what is happening in, uh, in these colliders. And we already know a lot from these experiments, yeah, not just from the LHC, but also from the experiments which were there before. And we found a lot of particles. And this is what we call today the standard model of particles. So what I show you here on the right-hand side is a diagram of all subatomic um, fundamental particles, which we know today, or which we think that we know. We are quite certain. And for your everyday life, actually, only these three are important. Yeah? And for a, lot of, for a long time, we only knew about these and everything was fine. Yeah? So we knew up quarks, down quarks, and the electron. The electron, everybody knows. So up quarks and down quarks, they might not be so well known. But what happens is if you have combinations of these two, they just do electron, uh, sorry, they do protons and neutrons. And protons and neutrons, you know chemistry. Uh, if you combine protons with neutrons, you form the elements, and the elements make up everything. Yeah? And the elements are, for example, uh, with an atomic, uh, with an atom here on the left hand side, they made it in into the logo of the FZU, which is also I think on the, on the build, maybe even here on, yeah, I think even on the pole here. So these make up everything that you know. This guy here, which is abbreviated with a gamma, which is called the photon. This you also know. This is what we call light. Yeah, particle physicists um, consider also light a particle. You might have heard this before since Einstein when he was explaining the 
photoelectric effect. But this is also um, the particle which makes radio waves. It's also the particle which in your microwave heats up your, uh, your soup when, when you turn it on. Everything that radiates and everything that shines, everything that has to do with electromagnetism is an instance of this particle, which we call the photon. And it turns out almost everything is made up of particles, yeah? not necessarily of all of them, but you are made of particles, atoms are made of particles, as I said, light is made of particles, and also fundamental forces, like things, energy that keeps atoms together is made of particles, and this is what we study. Maybe space-time is made of particles, we're not so sure about this. Yeah? Some people claim yes, some people claim no. But, but let's see what the future brings. And what I, see, what I show you here on the right hand side, yeah, in, in this wheel, these are all the particles that we know. But there could be more, there could also be more fundamental ones. Maybe all of these particles are made of, of something differently, like strings. People like string theory a lot. Um, but maybe not, we don't know. And um, here in the middle, you see the Higgs boson have probably heard of, because this was a, a groundbreaking discovery at the LHC in 2012, because this boson was predicted or was proposed by Peter Higgs, Higgs here on the right hand side and his French colleague Francois Anglaire, who actually did it the same time, nobody has ever heard of him because it's called Higgs boson today. Um, and they predicted this particle has to exist more than 60 years ago and only 2012 they measured it. M what I'm showing you here on the left hand side, yeah, this is what, what triggers a Nobel Prize. Um, to yeah, what, what you see in this graphic in the yellowish line, this is a theory prediction if there was no Higgs boson, and the data is what they measured. And you see here where the x-axis is at 125 roughly, there is some excess. And this excess is not compatible with uh, whatever was there without the Higgs boson. And so this was the confirmation there has to be a new particle, and it behaves like a Higgs boson, and that was it. So one big problem with the LHC and with particle physics is the following. There was nothing new and nothing discovered since 2012. Yeah? And this is not just a problem, some people call it a crisis, because uh, we actually expected a lot of things to be found and to, to be seen at the LHC. Cool things like extra dimensions, black holes, supersymmetry, dark matter, new particles, string theory, and everything. And people were really putting their money where their mouth was at this point, and they were building a lot of uh, cool theories about the LHC and nothing turned out to be true. So it turns out we are right now in a, um, in a problematic and one could even say boring situation. But on the other hand, we have, we have things to explore because there are problems in particle physics we know we cannot solve today, um, but we might have to go in a different direction in particle physics. And one direction to move is, for example, to astroparticle physics. Yeah? This is the, uh, the region where I'm also per personally working on. Um, and I think it's particularly interesting because here we study uh, to go back to the universe as I showed you in the beginning um, in terms of the clusters, the galaxies, the stars, things which are there today, things that we see. And we try to understand what's happening in the universe uh, in our extragalactic or galactic neighborhood, what's happening at the with the biggest things that there are, like with clusters and galaxies, and what's happening with the smallest things, the particles they are made of. So we really try to understand the big structures and the small structures at the same time. This is what astroparticle physics is about. So, um, well, why are we trying to do this, you could ask. Yeah? And um, usually this is a good question. Um, and, uh, well, also this time, of course. Uh, but one thing which I personally find very fascinating is uh, something that Carl Sagan at some point said, you're made of stardust. And what I'm showing you here is a elementary table you maybe know from your chemistry uh, lessons. But the colors here are something different at some uh, point. Yeah, So the colors here tell you where these elements come from. Because elements cannot really be created or changed a lot, yeah? except for very few um, exceptions. And this green here, this green part tells you these elements were created in the Big Bang. This were, and they're relatively few. Yeah? It's only hydrogen, uh, helium, and lithium. And everything else had to come later. And something which is particularly interesting here is uh, the blue and the red part, which are explosions of stars. And if I just highlight some of the few elements that are very, let's say, important for us to, to live, for example, um, here we have, for example, nitrogen and oxygen. 
and they're almost exclusively made in explosions of stars. So the air you breathe is made of, of stardust. There is no way of creating this somehow differently. Elements that you need in your bones or in your muscles, like, uh, uh, how is it called, potassium and calcium. Yeah? Calcium you find, for example, in your teeth. So if you pay attention to your teeth, they are made of dust that was made in explosions of stars. So iron, for example, that we can extract from the earth, we can uh, pull it out of different uh, combinations, but we cannot create iron itself. It always has, to, it has always been there and it has been created in an in explosion of a supernova relatively close by to us today. So, um, yeah, how are these elements actually created and how do they uh, find their way to us? Uh, usually in the death of a, of a star. So when you have a big, big giant star, uh, not just like our sun, but uh, some, some of them are a big bigger, some of them are much bigger actually, um, they create elements by burning. So uh, you might have heard about fusion. So what, what happens is you take hydrogen or helium atoms, you put them together, and some energy gets created. Yeah, if you take a different element, you put it together with something, and energy gets created. And this happens at insanely high temperatures. This happens only in stars as of today. We are trying to do it on Earth, but it's a bit complicated. So what happens with time is that heavier and heavier elements, they just sink into the middle of, of a big star. So at some point, the star is shaped like an onion. And in the outside, you have lighter elements, like neon, oxygen, silicon. And in the middle, you have a core which is almost entirely made of iron. And if the star gets older and older, the iron core gets bigger and bigger. And uh, one thing that happens is here that um, this core is not really sustainable for a long time. Because it's a little bit as, as if you're playing Jenga and you're stacking and stacking, but the core is not just a Jenga tower, it's also the bomb at the same time. If this core becomes too big at some point, it will collapse. Yeah, and form a very small, dense portion of its original size with, a, with neutrons and protons. And this triggers an explosion, which then goes in the other direction. And this explosion is what, what we would call a supernova. And it's a, an extremely bright event. Uh, if it happens, we can see it with our own eyes. For example, there, has been, uh, there have been many records of uh, astronomers in the past. For example, Chinese astronomers in the, I think, 1000-something, which was the first human recorded supernova or one supernova in the 80s, which uh, has even been detected by some larger experiments of ours. And so now, actually desperately, we are waiting for another supernova to see, and hopefully, if it happens, we could see it a few days, maybe even a few weeks, with our own eyes at the night sky. So, in this explosion, what happens is all the elements that were created are just shoot out into space, yeah? and also a, a lot of different particles are, are created. For example, what I show you here on the left-hand side, this is a gold atom. The gold atom gets created in the moment of, of the supernova. Yeah? Only there the energy is, is large enough to create gold, silver, and everything. So the gold that you're wearing at your body, for example, with a wedding ring or something, it was forged in a supernova. And only then uh, put, pulled out of the earth uh, at some point by a, by a smith. Of course, a lot of light yeah, gets emitted. You, you remember the gamma letter that I had before here? And a lot of these particles here, which I didn't talk about today, uh, which are called neutrinos. Neutrinos are actually particles which are extremely interesting, but very hard to detect, because they fly almost through everything. So these are the particles which are actually created the most in a supernova, and they carry away most of the energy. And as it turns out, more than 300 billion billion particles pass your body every second, and you cannot do anything about it. Yeah? Most of them are neutrinos from supernovae, from ancient times when they were exploding some millions of years ago in our galactic neighborhood. Um, but I can calm you, most of them are, um, are harmless. Oh, is my time over already? Oh, not, not yet. Yeah. So m most of these come from supernovae. Um, most of these are neutrinos and they are harmless. But sometimes, sometimes there are particles which are not so harmless, uh, which hit the Earth at insane speeds. They come from somewhere out of space. They actually, they're so high energetic, they don't even hit the Earth directly. When they hit the atmosphere, they create a chain reaction yeah, of new particles being created 
much, much more energetic than uh, in the LHC, in this, in this particle colliders that I showed you before. And you see them being created again and again and again, and at some point you have a, uh, something that we call an air shower. So a carpet of particles hitting the Earth at the surface. We call them ultra high energy cosmic rays. And um, they're so high energetic, yeah, a bullet with the equivalent speed, with the equivalent equivalent energy would have the energy of one billion nuclear bombs. Yeah, this would probably destroy everything. But since this is only just one particle, it has the energy equivalent of a tennis ball, yeah, which is still a lot. The problem is we do not know where they come from. They have so much energy they cannot come from, from supernovae. Um, we have no clue today. Yeah, There are some candidates, there are some um, uh, some things that we speculate where they uh, could come from, but we are definitely until today not sure where these insane particles, where they are created. And this is the um, the topic where I'm particularly personally working on, and I will spend the rest of the talk a bit going into detail of ultra high energy cosmic rays and how we detect them because they are, I think, very fascinating phenomena in the Earth. So the way to detect these particles is by trying to measure this carpet that they create of secondary particles at the Earth. And the best place to do is, is the Piaget Observatory in Argentina. So here on the lower left, you can see there's a small map with uh, the X that marks the spot. This is where we built the Piaget Observatory, which I think, I have not read it somewhere, but I've, uh, I've not read it uh, the opposite. I think it's the largest experiment in the world because it covers a huge area uh, with its detector stations. And every dot that you see here, which is located in the Argentinian desert, is one of these um, small stations. And this detector, it's fairly simple. Yeah, It looks like uh, just like a bucket. And what it is, is just a bucket full of water. And it has a solar panel. That's it. And I will tell you in a second how it works. And here at the edge of this array of detectors, we have four buildings, which look like this, with telescopes, which help us additionally to take a look at, um, at these particles. So why is it so big and why is it in Argentina, you might ask. Yeah, so just as a small scale comparison, if we would have built it in Czech Republic, um, we would have moved some stuff probably yeah, because it's very, very large. Only in Argentina there is um, there's so much empty space and only in Argentina it's so high up in, in altitude so that we can, can build it. And uh, well, why does it need to be so large, you, you might ask. Yeah, because um, if we zoom in a little bit, these detector stations, which are only uh, 10 meters in diameter, so I'm exaggerating here a little bit, they are put in such a way that we can measure this footprint of air showers. And uh, if such a high energy cosmic ray, ultra high energy cosmic ray hits the atmosphere, it would create a footprint at, uh, at the ground, which is of the size of Prague. It's insanely large. And um, yeah, th this is, I think, a diameter of roughly 10 kilometers. And this happens. This happens also in Prague. Most of the time you don't know because it's really not dangerous. It's just particles flying around that hit the Earth. And you can see them, for example, in the cloud chamber, which is also in the other room. Yeah, I'm advertising this, uh, the hangout area again. Um, you can see these particles just hit the Earth every now and then with a frequency of, yeah, depending on which energy they have, once every year uh, in, a, in a square kilometer. And the way... Uh, we detect them, as I said before, is by trying to detect these air showers they create. So what happens is um, they get emitted probably by some galaxies. We are not sure yet, but most probably some galaxies or some things in some galaxies are emitting them. They fly some millions and millions of years. They hit the, uh, the atmosphere and they create this cascade of, of additional secondary particles that we can see. And if this happens, yeah, for example, over the PRG Observatory in Argentina, uh, which this is a picture that has been taken there, uh, on the one hand, there's some very faint light that gets emitted by this cascade. And we can see it only in, in clear, moonless nights, yeah, so only when it's really perfectly dark, which is another reason why you go to very remo remote places with such experiments. So if you want to be a particle physicist, it's uh, actually a good chance to go to some remote places where you can also do holiday, for example, there making a new experiment like this in La Palma for everybody who is interested. And also in Chile, in, uh, in South Africa, and so on and so on. Uh, it, yeah, it's a nice opportunity. And 
the different uh, the two different detection mechanisms on the one hand as i mentioned uh, here is the uh, the telescope building which tries to to look at the light that is emitted directly and the other one here are these tanks at the bottom which try to uh, to detect the particles directly which are created by the cascade of, uh, of ultra high energy cosmic rays and it's probably the simplest detector in the world and you could actually do this in your kitchen at home the only thing you need is some bucket of water and a photomultiplier because what happens is the particles go through and when they pass this big bucket of water it's just ordinary water it's nothing uh, nothing special they either decay inside or they leave a track and along their track they emit a very 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 tiny piece of bit of light and this light if it's completely dark and if you have the special camera for it you can make it visible so what happens is you just spread a lot of these detectors all over the place and if they at the same time all of them report we have a tiny little bit of light then you know one of these cosmic rays hit the earth and one of these uh, gigantic um, events happened and this is how it looks like then at the POG observatory in our what we call the event display we have telescopes located here at the edge of our array and the particles come from here they start to produce more particles in the atmosphere over and over again you have this explosion of uh, of particles being created they start to shine La light gets emitted and at the ground these detector stations they report with a different timing at some point we saw some um, some signal and the coincidence of all this of all these detectors actually gives you then a signal and by the way this is why um, the the, the whole experiment is named after Pierre Auger. Pierre Auger was a French physicist and he he climbed on top of the uh, Jungfraunjoch in Switzerland and he had some very simple detectors and he proved that if you put the detectors at very huge distances that they will report something at the same time. And this is the, uh, the ultimate proof that they have to be a, um, that there has to be a common origin. So he showed that there are some gigantic things happening in the atmosphere which which trigger your detector as simple as it might be at the ground and what we want to do with these particles when we see them is as i said we would try to study them because we're still trying to find the origin of these ultra high energy cosmic rays in our galaxy yeah, in this gigantic thing that I, I was trying to talk about now and um, some scenarios are already ruled out, ruled out we know that they cannot come directly from uh, things in our galaxy because nothing is in our galaxy which is so high energetic to create these particles which is a good thing because it could barbecue us accidentally it cannot come from the galactic center because our galactic center is uh, relatively cold so we live in a galaxy which is let's say rather boring but boring galaxies are good because you can live in them there are a lot of galaxies where in which you cannot live because they are too hot so what what is left as a um, as an origin are probably well different galaxies which are somewhat different for example a bit hotter uh, a bit more hostile to its possible inhabitants or even larger structures somewhere out there and um, yeah this is what we are trying to to search for um, but there's still work to do so at some point yeah, maybe our generation or next generation of physicists uh, are going to unravel this this mystery and uh, all of this, yeah, not just uh, the not just the Auger part, but everything that I talked about is happening here at FZU. So, if you're interested, yeah, um, pass by. Maybe at some point you can join the family and start working here on interesting things. And with this, I already conclude, and I just uh, try to uh, to motivate you to be relaxed and stay curious, yeah, because you're just here. And they are very big and interesting things ahead. Thanks a lot.